Hey there, and welcome back to The Few Show. I'm your host, David Tran, and today I'm joined by Ludwig Dumont. He's the founder and CEO of Willow, and he's really passionate about democratizing technology and, and ensuring underserved communities can benefit from technological advancements. Thanks for joining us on the show. Thanks for having It's a pleasure. So before we begin, can you just give us a little bit of background on Willow and how you've decided to build Willow? Yeah, sure. Um, so basically, Willow... Um, is all about making sure that like an underserved community within the business scene, uh, uh, more specifically SMBs, finally get everything that they need to build out a strong presence on social media. Because like, like we've seen it through the last year, right? I mean, um, it's really important to have a strong social media presence if you really want to be able to connect with uh, like your audience. Um, so, and up to today, like there's not really something or there's no real solution that really focuses on helping those SMBs, like what we call like the underserved community when it comes down to social media. And my, my goal is to actually ensure that all those SMBs are able to grow and we want to like uh, empower them uh, to grow by uh, helping, out, helping them to build out sustainable and a strong social media presence, right? Um, so that's kind of the, the end goal. We want to help as many SMBs as we can. Um, and the idea uh, for Willow, basically, um, um, it's actually a funny story because like I come from an SMB family myself, like all my aunts and uncles, like they run an SMB or there's a, they're a business operator to, uh, to some capacity. And like um, when we get together with the family, like when I was young, but still it happens occasionally, they ask me all these questions. Hey, should we do Facebook? Hey, should we uh, do something on LinkedIn? Hey, should we? What should we do with the website? I've always been like the the the. Um, I've always been been the one that gets confronted with all those questions when it comes down to like what a SMB should do when it comes down to social. Um, but it wasn't actually until I was consulting large enterprises with their social media that it kind of got to me. Like, I mean, this doesn't make any sense, right? Because all those large multinationals, they have like tons of expertise when it comes down to social. They have like truckloads of money and they have a lot of time. So it does make sense that like, like we're building solutions or we're basically consulting those large corporations because they have everything it takes to do it themselves, right? It's, it, it makes way more sense to help mm -hmm. those SMBs because they, they lack financial resources to be great at social. They don't have that much time to focus on social themselves because they have a business to run, right? Let's be honest about it. And they also don't have the expertise to do social media. So it was only actually after me helping my uncles and aunts, like in a very family fashion, uh, it's only when I started consulting large corporations that I, 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 it got to me. We need to focus on helping the SMBs and we don't need to focus on like helping the, the large enterprises. Um, and that's kind of the backstory of Willow actually. Can you walk me through the specific types of SMBs that are best fit for Willow? Yeah, sure. So basically, um, we tend to focus a lot on what we call like professional service providers um, and like uh, solopreneurs. So typically, uh, the best fit in terms of like customer persona for Willow are accounting firms, uh, small lawyer firms, mm -hmm. um, uh, small consulting firms, like people that are actually building out a personal brand. Um, the, the, the common denominator between all those businesses, all those SMBs, is that they have like a very um, expertise-driven business model. So they, they have knowledge and they have expertise that they market. And social media, media really mm -hmm. helps them to actually leverage that knowledge and make sure that what they do on social media is a translation of their expertise. So uh, that's kind of typically the, the, the industry that we focus on with Willow. And when you were first solving this problem, what was the MVP that you built with your team? <laughs> but that's also actually a funny story. So ba basically, like um, in the beginning, we actually like before actually building out the product, right? We just like created what we called like uh, social media packages, right? And those were like like um, uh, you would actually go to a website, you would like. Take package one or package two. Package one would, for example, be like five social media channels, like uh, 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 unlimited posts that we share on your channels. Uh, uh, you have a call with, a, with an operator and you can actually um, see the progress of uh, your social media through a platform. 
So the MVP of Willow was actually a, um, um, a service. So it actually, we, we packaged it, we were packaging it as a product, but it was actually a ser service. So we were not, we were yeah. using tools ourselves and like make it like scalable from like a company perspective, but like our customers didn't really have a front end. So they couldn't really go to a, a website or they couldn't actually like uh, um, open up a tool to see how everything was evolving and we we, we, we did that just to understand hmm. like what the what the most important things were that we needed to productize um, and then I, I would say that like the first like real MVP like the product that the, that we had was kind of a <laughs> it was kind of a website you would go to uh, and on that website you would actually like get like um, like um, five to ten like social me media posts uh one under the other right uh um, and then you would just actually say like uh swipe right or swipe left and swipe right would be hey i like this post so i just want to kind of schedule it on my social media and swipe left would be i don't like this post right so we kind of we're we're kind of like tinderizing social media so yeah, yeah. Kind of <laughs> but like everything that went after like like than actually sharing it on the social media channels that wasn't in the product yet. But we, we really wanted to understand how people would like interact with content that was proposed to them. Because we see that that is kind of the biggest time spent for a lot of like business operators is like figuring out what is good content for me to share, right? Like how can I get inspired in terms of content? So like our MVP was really centered around this idea. How can we inspire our customers with good content? That was kind of the, the MVP. And then like, Moving forward, like typically as it goes with startups, we, we were very close to our customers. We really tried to understand what was kind of keeping them up at night when it comes down to social media. And then like uh, steadily but surely, we started building out the whole product around that kind of uh, idea of content inspiration. How did you know when to transition from a service into a product? Or was that always the goal? That was always the goal. That was actually always the goal, um, uh, because of course, like we wanted to, yeah, like, like it, it's our mission to help as many SMBs as we can, right? So, like, if you have a very service-driven business, like that's that's not that's never going to happen, right? You're never going to come to a scale where you can help like millions and millions of of, uh, of SMBs. Right. So we knew that, like, for us to like achieve our mission of helping as many SMBs as we want uh, or as we can, we needed to actually build a product, right? Um, but but we started off like with a service model because we really wanted to understand what is like the typical manual labor that like in a service driven um, agency uh, happens. What are those typical manual labor um, components that we want to productize, right? Um, so we, we we started mapping them and then like with our with our technical team and with our CTO we started understanding like if we want to productize this how should we do it? Um, and then like that's kind of how we build out the product um, moving forward. How many SMBs did you have to help before you had a solid understanding of what you wanted to turn into the product? That's a great question. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I think it's, 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 it's linked to like the volume of SMBs that we helped, but it's also linked to the, 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 uh, the lifetime of the company. I mean, mm -hmm. I think like, uh, you don't need to have like a big batch of SMBs to really understand what they need, but the, the relationship that you have with an SMB needs to be long enough to really like from a full cycle perspective, understand understand what it is that they want to see in your product, right? Um, and I would say that like from that perspective, it took us like um, one year to one and a half year to really understand what we needed to do in terms of a product or how our solution really needed to look like to make sure that like it was like at its peak in terms of compatibility for our customers. Um, I, I, I would I would look at it more from like the time that you spend with a customer um, and not really from like how many SMBs that we had, if, if that makes sense. Gotcha. And when you were turning this into a product, how long did it take to build a product from the time you knew what you wanted to build to the time it was ready for people to consume? Oh, we launched way too soon. So, uh, like, I think, like, we were really, really, um, <laughs> we were embarrassed by what we launched in the beginning. But I think that's kind of, it's kind of the, the right way of doing things. Um, so, I mean, I think it only took us, like, um, maybe two months or so, or three months, um, before we actually launched the first real version of our products. And then we just, like, were, we were, like, iterating like, uh, like crazy. Um, and we've been iterating like crazy ever since. Um, um, but I really believe that like launching, 
soon and launching before you feel comfortable launching is really the way forward because that's actually the only thing to learn. Otherwise, you're you're just going to build something out. It's going to be a behemoth. But then maybe that behemoth is not going to like really resonate well with your customers. And then you have all this technical debt and what have you not. So you just want to avoid that, right? And if, if the good thing is that like if you if you launch really quickly and you, you are super customer centric, so... Uh, you are really in touch with your customers, like, and that's also where, where the service component is really great, right? Like, they, I mean, they, 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 they forgive you for like not having a super mature product. The, the, what for them, and I think for every customer, is the most important thing is that they feel listened to and that they feel catered to. And uh, having a service mm-hmm. component in the business model, of course, allows that like way more than just having a product, quote unquote. What are some things you learn as a company leader from the time you launched the MVP? based on the feedback you got from your service-based uh, clients? You mean what I what I learned as a business leader, like from like the, the way we work with customers or like more yeah. related to like how we're building out the company? I don't... Um, okay. Um, I think like from, a, from a, the relationship with the customer um, point of view, I would say that like... Um, Focusing on happy customers and like those real champions and building stuff mm-hmm. for them is way more important than like building out features for customers that that are maybe not the best fit for your company. Um, I'm mm-hmm. really uh, super convinced that like it, it makes way more sense to build for a, a, a community of like super users and super happy customers and really try to find more of those and to be better for them than always listening to the customers that churn. Because, I mean, you're always going to have churn. The thing is that if you build out for people that are basically not really happy with your product, you're just going to build out a, a feature fetish kind of a product. And then, like, you, you, you miss or we miss at least the purpose of, like, having a very intuitive, easy product that really caters to, like, the needs of an SMB and a business operator who doesn't have, like, a PhD in marketing. Um, so I think that's something that I learned from, like, a customer's perspective, like, built for your super users. Um um, and then, like from like a, a, a company, like team um, um, uh, perspective, I would say that like what I call like situational leadership is really important. Like um, definitely, like when you're in the trenches yourself, like in the beginning, like I'm like the CEO, right? But in the beginning, I was like doing sales. I was doing like a lot of stuff. So I think that like you really have to understand that like depending on the stage that you are in as a company and the stage that you are in as a team, like your role as a CEO and as a, as a founder needs to actually grow with the company, right? So um, um, you need to, at some point in time, you need to, you need to, um, you need to like step out of the operational role and you really need to be the person that is actually um, like uh, um, uh, translating the mission of the company and of like making sure that every everyone within the different departments, uh, customer success, product, sales, is actually uh, continuously reminded of what the mission and the vision of the company is. Um, so, so I learned the hard way, and I'm still learning it the hard way to be super honest. But I think that's that's totally fine. But like having a good view on situational leadership and having a shared view on what leadership is for your company is really important. So you need to you need to mm-hmm. actually be able to reflect on who you are as a leader like be intellectually honest if stuff doesn't work and not try to hide yourself behind like um behind like your personality you need to learn you need to get better and you need to accept the fact that like as a leader as a ceo you need to you need to get better and don't try to hide it but just like um um uh uh, 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 put the, the right semantics around your flaws and then find people that can help you in actually becoming a better leader um, hmm. and, and not pretending. Like if you don't know stuff, you don't know stuff. If, if you are uncomfortable in doing something, just, just make sure that it's known. Uh, building out a transparent co- company culture and actually also showing as a leader that you're not flawless and that you have uncertainties is really important to create a, um, a team where things can be said, right? Where people don't feel, okay, hey, I should be should be very, very, um, very mindful about saying this or not. Like you really want to create a, a culture where like transparency is key, where people can actually, if they don't feel good about something, that can actually they they can they can they can let you know, right? I mean, I think that's really crucial. For the super users that you're talking about earlier, what are some of the wins that they get from working 
uh, with your your platform? Or what are some of the wins that you've observed? Um, the big one of the biggest wins that we uh, observe is that like they're able to um, build out a consistent social media presence. So it's not something that basically works for two weeks and then like um, um, gets dropped again because they have other stuff to do. Uh, uh, no, no, with Willow, they are actually in the middle of like all the uh, the hectic stuff of building out the business. They're able to, on a consistent basis, have a strategy and a presence on social media, right? So they don't need to worry about like, okay, I haven't posted this week or like last month, I just posted twice on my social channels. Like we ensure that the consistency is there and it's actually the consistency that is like the baseline for building out a strong social media presence, right? I mean... It's a bit like I always compare it with like working out because like I'm I'm a, I'm a runner like I I, uh, I I work out quite often like if you really want to get good at running and if you want to get better at running or at working out like you need to have a consistent pace right you don't need to mm-hmm. you don't want to do it like four times in the first week and then like have nothing in terms of like working out uh, for three more weeks and then working out again no no you need to be you need to be working out twice a week. One week, two weeks, three weeks, two months, four months, two years, etc. Right, and mm-hmm. I think like creating that consistency in terms of social media for customers is really like a, a big win because it, it helps them to build a community around the social media. And then a second big win for me is the fact that they're actually trying to, or or they they start to understand social media. It's not a black box for them anymore. It's like mm-hmm. they they really start to understand the benefits on of doing something a certain way. So like that, that knowledge transfer and like creating this notion of that they understand it too is really important for me because I, I mean, I think like transferring knowledge and making sure that people really understand what social media is, is for me a big part of like democratizing social media and like making sure that it's not an opaque, vague kind of a concept, but that people really get it, right? Because you need to get social media to really see the value. Something I've noticed from your platform is that it combines software as well as coaching. Was that, that, I feel like that's a relatively unique distinguishing factor for your company. Was that always the model? And how have you seen the coaching component help your users? So, so yeah, so I'm really like, uh, like with Willow, we're really big on what we call like um, um, uh, uh, injecting like expertise into the product, right? So I really believe that like the future, for example, Mm -hmm. of uh, of software as a service is not like building software, it's actually injecting expertise and uh, injecting knowledge Mm -hmm. into a product or creating a, um, uh, a knowledge component around your product, right? So... Um, I've always, I've always been in this kind of a model where I said, okay, if we want to do this the right way, we need to make sure that there's enough like expertise and guidance, uh, around social media for our customers. And typically like in our case, this is being translated by the fact that like every customer at Willow has like, uh, his or her dedicated social media expert slash social media coach, which is basically going to be there for them from the get-go is going to help them creating the structure, is going to making sure that like at the end of the month, they really understand what is going on. And then like slowly but surely, we're also like kind of injecting that expertise into the product, right? Because I want to, like we want to build an opinionated product that is basically um, translating the expertise in terms of doing social media through the product itself. So like now we're in this kind of, um, uh, uh, model where to, those two things, like the the coaching and the product, they are uh, uh, they are um, working together quite nicely, and they are super compatible. And um, I know, I mean, mm-hmm. some people might say, okay, but it limits like your scalability, right? Because there's always this notion of having a coach, but like that coaching is not like something that mm-hmm. might be necessarily. Um, still active six months down the road, right? If if our product teaches the customer enough what social media is about, six months down the road, they might have enough for just working with the opinionated product that is also like translating expertise and they don't need the coaching anymore, right? But I, I just want to make sure that the coaching really helps them to hit the ground running, to kick things off and making sure that they really have like um, someone they can fall back on if they have questions, right? Um, but it is true. It's a unique, like our business model, like having this hybrid kind of a thing. It's kind of pretty unique in our space. So when it comes to convincing a lot of SMBs, I know a lot of SMBs out there that don't have a social media presence. 
how would you recommend a like a SMB get started with social media if they're one of your like cohorts that you previously mentioned serving? Um, I I think it all starts with like um, it all starts with like having the willingness and having the ambition to um, see social media as a structural component of your business, right? Um, like. If you really get that social media for a business is not a nice to have anymore, but is really a need to have, and it's something that you want to, and you need to invest in to be like, um, to be, uh, uh, um, do not like fall behind in terms of like where the world is going. Um, I think it all starts there. If a business owner has this uh, understanding of like the importance of social media, sees, as, sees it as an important component for his or her business, like, that's a very strong starting point to then like start mm -hmm. doing social media. Um, if if they if they look at it more from like huh, this is something nice to have or uh, it's marketing whatever right like they're never going to have like this willingness and this hunger to be good at it right um, and then we can do everything that we can we can move the world for you we can actually like like uh, we can like build your social media like. Uh, in a fashion that nobody would ever think of as possible. If you don't really, as a business owner, understand the importance of social media, you're always going to be disappointed. Um, mm. So, like, understanding that social media is a key component of a, of a modern SMB is, is key. Um, and then everything that follows after is is, is going to be a, um, a plus. But uh, but uh, but you need to you need to you need to really understand social media. If you had to distill down the benefit and power of social media into one benefit for a majority of SMBs, how would you describe it to them? Oh, that's a great question. Um, uh, that's a great question. Um, the go-to answer would be like building out like um, uh, thought leadership um, for your company that people actually understand why, why you and, and why your company is best placed to do a, a specific thing or help them with a specific thing. So I think that like the whole notion of thought leadership and building brand awareness around your business is, um, is key and is crucial and is like a very like, uh, broadly, uh, carried objective for quite some SMBs. And that is typically the one uh, with which we, uh, lead and which is going to be like the fundamental thing. And then, Secondary would be like employee branding, like um, like young people uh, uh, fresh out of college or looking for a great job at an SMB. They also want to see that you're present on like the digital roads, right? If they look for you on, on, on Facebook or on Instagram and you're nowhere to be found, you, you're actually, you don't exist for them, right? So like mm -hmm. if you really want to attract talent and if you want to attract like uh, the new generation of talents, then like having a strong social media presence is going to be key in like your employer branding uh, trajectory so like brand awareness together with employer branding are two like main components and then um and then a third one I, it's needless to say that like social media is also a, a, a big uh, driver in terms of like uh, a, a sales and marketing funnel like uh like um like you create credibility for what you do uh towards potential customers through social media by sharing for example customer reviews by like uh, showing that you know what you're talking about so i i i really i really see that social media is a big part of like um, a very strong and, and a very, very uh, performant um, marketing and sales funnel. Uh, but it also needs to be understood that like social media in that respect is never going to be a, a, um, a silver bullet, right? It's not because you share a post that suddenly like 20 people are at your doorstep waiting to, to work with you, right? But it's really an important driver in getting there. If that makes sense. How long do you guesstimate social media? So let's say you're talking to an SMB, they're a friend of your family's or a friend of a friend of a friend. And they've never done social media before and they run call like either like a law firm or a accounting firm. How long does it normally take for them to invest either in time or money into social media before it's reasonable for them to have an expectation of these benefits you just described? I think uh, it depends on like how you define like uh, uh, the benefits and how you define like the results. Like hmm. immediately, like it's, it's only going to take a month for them to really see, okay, like, like if I go to my social media, like I can be proud because like we're sharing great stuff. Right. Like I feel as if my social media is a good representation of our business. Like there's there's like a structure, there's a good cadence. So like it's 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 alive. Yeah, it's alive and it's kicking. And and that's a very strong and a very important first result right. because like there's 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 vibrance, right? There's stuff going on. And then like in terms of like ROI, in terms of like um, 
uh, number of followers or, or um, people uh, engaging with your brand, I would say it's going to take anywhere between like two and four months before we really okay. get, the, get the results that we're aiming for. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's from that perspective because like it's a very compatible way of working. I mean, um, it's, a, it's a very democratic way of looking at it. Uh, but also we, we just we, we want to uh, educate our customers about the fact that it's never going to be that like or that share that is going to make the difference. It's actually going to be um, ensuring that there's consistency and that like people see you around, not like this month, not next month. But if they check you out in six or in seven months from now, they still see that the activity and that the cadence that you had before is still being maintained because you want to look alive, right? Okay. And as it relates to uh, spending time as leader of the company, how do you, how, what does a typical day for you look like? Um, so uh, that's a, that's a great question. So um, a typical day for me, um, I'm still quite involved in the, in the, um, in the sales team. So I'm, I'm still, um, I'm still talking to quite some prospects. Um, I'm still like uh, evangelizing Willow to quite some prospects. And I think it's great because it, it really allows you as a, as a, as a leader of a company to understand like what are the struggles uh, uh, potential customers are faced with. So it, 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 it makes you think and it makes you think of how can I do this better? How can we actually like uh, create an even more exhaustive solution for a customer? So I would say that like a typical day would be like me having two to three um, um, conversations with potential customers um, uh, and then that's kind of being spiced up with like, um, 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 checking in with the team, like making sure that everybody is in a, in a good spot, like, um, um, making sure everybody feels hurt, uh, like, uh, teaching, um, people stuff, um, and being around actually like being, uh, available for your people, because I don't think, and that's again, my take on leadership, like you don't need to stand at, at the top of a company and like always yelling, I we need to do this, I we need to do that. You, 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 that doesn't work anymore. You need to be available for your people. Yeah, you know you know what I'm saying, right? Hmm. Like being approachable is right, super, right. super important. And I, and I try to like, yeah, like being super approachable for people like um, 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 uh, and, and being around and that they can actually talk to you, that they know that your, your door is always open. And of course, I also spend like, a fair amount of my time on like uh, stakeholder management, right? Like investor relations, um, mm -hmm. making sure that our board members are are uh, fully aware of everything that's going on, and um, and also making sure that like the vision and the mission of the company is like on a continuous basis being defined because we're a growing company. So like we need to make sure that how we grow is actually in line with how how we want to grow as a in terms of our mission. So also making sure that we always stay in line with uh, where we want to go with the company is also pretty important for me. Out of the inbound leads that come to Willow, what's the percentage of them, if you had to ballpark, come from your social media presence? Come from our own social media? I would say 40%. Okay. And the other 60% being referrals? Okay. Um, so referrals uh, in terms of like customers, like uh, recommending other customers, you mean? Yes. Um, I would say like that's that's typically something that happens a lot. So like uh, uh, I get a lot of like emails from like an existing customer that introduces an, another potential customer um, to Willow that way, um, and that's great. And um, because like there's there's this uh, this notion of uh, of happiness uh, from one uh, customer to a potential other. But the thing is, it's not super scalable. Um, um, mm -hmm. But we really look at scalability uh, as an infrastructural thing for the company. And like social media can be a way of like making sure that like the way you generate leads is scalable. Uh, and we always work on lead magnets, like what we call lead magnets. So th those are basically things that are super relevant for potential customers of ours. And that will basically help us to get the conversation going, to actually show how we can uh, add value for them. Um, and like, of course, in the beginning, like you need to balance outbound and inbound because like in the beginning, nobody knows you. I mean, uh, people don't even uh, know your brand. They never check you out. So you need to make sure that like your outbound efforts are at a high enough pace so you can like evangelize, you can create word of mouth, mm -hmm. that you can create like uh, uh, um, 
awareness around your brand within small communities. And then once you have that, 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 that kind of a, that seed planted, then you can start like deploying inbound on those specific markets because people will already have heard about you from another account, for example. Um, so I, I think that like that, that kind of a balance between outbound and inbound, yeah. inbound marketing is really important like uh, for, for building out your company. And to be, to be very, very honest, I don't think that outbound is ever going to go away for us because mm-hmm. it's, such a, it's such a strong driver. It's such mm-hmm. a strong driver. Is there a specific channel in outbound that you've noticed to be more successful than others for your company? Um, um, that's a that's a good question. Like for us, um, uh, LinkedIn is a very interesting channel. Um, uh, so because you have quite some business owners on LinkedIn, uh, if they're on LinkedIn, it's all, it's already like an indication that they're that they're like invested in social media that they kind of spend enough attention on creating out their, uh, their own social media presence. Mm. So we work on LinkedIn a lot from outbound. Um, and then of course there's this typical ways of working with like, uh, for example, um, partners within specific, uh, industries, let's say, uh, an organization that brings together accounts on a frequent basis and helps them with like the digitization of their whole infrastructure. Um, mm-hmm. that is also a, a specific way of working on outbound. So it's a combination of LinkedIn, uh, um, those kind of a network and then also, uh, emailing. So we also, we're pretty big on emailing too. Um, and, and I would say that those are the, the three most important drivers for us. Okay. And in terms of managing all this, like how, how do you split your time between like work and not work? Like I, I imagine that's, it sounds like a lot of responsibility in your plate. Yeah, the, the thing is, the good thing about me is um, I'm I'm really obsessed with Willow, so it's it's like a, it's it's an obsession, right? I I and it's not something that I'm I feel uh, um, I don't feel I, of course I feel responsible for Willow, but it's not something that I need to rationalize for myself. I don't need to say, hey, you're responsible for Willow. It's like it's like ingrained in who I am, and it's ingrained in my personality. So. And the good thing about that is because it's that like um, uh, intrinsic and it's that much linked to my nature. Like mm-hmm. I'm always thinking about Willow and I'm always like focusing on Willow. But if I'm, for example, spending time with my family, it's not going to hinder me um, in terms of like uh, like uh, 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 playing around with my son or, or having like a, a, a nice little stroll with my wife because it's not something that I continuously need to remind myself of, okay, you shouldn't be focused on Willow. It's like something that is so subtly like um, mm. present in my personality that it's always there. Um, but I'm just like, like from more like how I externalize it when I'm with the family, I'm not externalizing that. It's, it's, it's mm. going on inside of me and I'm like digesting stuff, but I'm not externalizing. I'm not always talking to my wife about like, hey, this Willow, hey, that Willow. Or I'm not like telling my son, hey, we shouldn't play around because I need to do stuff for Willow, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm able to kind of find that, that right balance. Um, um, so the obsession with the company really helps. And then also like, I have a pretty high energy, um, level. So I'm able to like combine like a lot of work with a lot of time with the family. I don't need that much sleep. For example, I take care of my body. I take care of my health. So I think like, like those different things combined help me to kind of build out the company, like be there for my wife and also like be there for two, uh, two kids. So, um. I, I'm present the company, in the moment and I meditate. Yeah. Where did the company name of Willow come from? Um, so actually, um, Willow is basically for us a good name because it's, uh, it, uh, it's a name that can be used for a, a tool, right? I mean, Willow could be the name and it is the name of, of software, but it could also like be the name of a coach, right? Coach mm-hmm. Willow, right? Um, so that kind of a balance, um, we found it pretty interesting because it allows us to like use it on, on, on multiple levels. Um, and then it's also like a, a, a willow is also a very strong and a very flexible tree, which of mm-hmm. course also helps for us in terms of like position our, ourselves as kind of um, company that's going to be around for a while. And it's also going to grow together with our customers. Hmm. I like that. In terms of, uh, your, your past experience, how do you feel like, uh, apart from your family, how have your past experiences helped you in the role you are in today? Mm, well, um, I would say that um, it's all about like, like uh, um, 
your meandering experience. So I, I never had like this clearly defined path for my career. I mean, I'm more of the type that actually um, does something and tries to make try, tries to make the best of it, and along the way learns what works and what doesn't work. Um, and I think that like like uh, having this more like um, seize the opportunity, seize the momentum kind of a, a way of working has helped me to kind of bring a, a lot of like disconnected things together. Um, and I think like bringing all those disconnected things together, for example, I'm just saying something in, in, in function of little like coming from an SMB family, like um, like understanding the needs of SMB operators and then like kind of. Um, going to San Francisco, being a, a social media marketing consultant for uh, for Facebook, for Twitter, for LinkedIn, for Instagram, like those two things are actually disconnected from each other. But if you hmm. think about Willow, they are connected because this this my my my, my experience as being a, a kid in an SMB family basically was then like the, the starting point for me to think about, hey, I'm working on this large technology industry right now where I'm doing social media. Like this doesn't make any sense. I should do this for them. So, and, and, and it's not that I had a clear, clear career path, but, um, but all those different experiences helped me to put things together and then, then build out the company, I guess. Are there things you've been learning in the call of the recent one or two years that you wish you knew five years ago? Um, um, yeah, worry le- like worry less, like, like worrying less about the future. Yeah. I think that's really important. Like, um, cause like we always tend to live to in. Sorry? And how do you do that? Yeah, by being present. Really by being present, by, by, by being here, by, mm-hmm. by looking at what's going on now and not trying to worry too much about like um, about a, a future. The thing is that like, I, like one, of, one of our investors actually gave this, this really cool gift. Um, I think it was like uh, at the end of uh, last year. And it's kind of this, this cool little piece of paper and, and um, it basically says, um, uh, do you have a problem in life? Uh, uh, yes. Can you do something about it? Yes. Um, can you do something about it? No. Do you have a problem in life? No. And it basically all leads to, uh, don't worry. Right? Because if you have oh, a problem in life and you can do something about it, you shouldn't worry. If you have a problem in life and you can't do anything about it, you shouldn't worry. Right? So in the end, you, you shouldn't worry too much because it's never going to solve something. Hmm. I like that. Was it hard to put that into practice? I, I have struggles putting that into practice. <laughs> um, uh, I think it's a, it's a constant or it's a continuous, um, um, it requires continuous reflection, right? I mean, you need to be aware of the fact that y- you potentially are going to worry and then you need to take a step back and like creating this habit for yourself to kind of see yourself worrying, taking a step back and saying like, hey, you shouldn't worry. And like doing that on, a, on, on, on the regular mm-hmm. and creating that habit of like doing that on the regular will then at some point in time help you to not worry anymore. Um, but you need to be aware of the fact that you're worrying. That's really like uh, the first step. Do you have any advice that you give to founders or soon to be founders who are watching this episode? Um, yeah, I mean, like, if you can dream it, you can do it. Like, don't feel held back because of um, reasons why you shouldn't do something. Because there's always going to be a reason why you shouldn't take the jump or why you shouldn't um, should, shouldn't uh, 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 do something about a, a problem that you're seeing in this world. But um, but uh, if if you feel comfortable in um, in taking a stand and like uh, embracing a goal in in uh, making up your own life and not trying to live a life that is basically already made for you, uh, then you, you should just do it. Like, um, uh, and yeah, don't think about stuff too much. Like just, just go for it. And like worst thing happens is that it doesn't work out. Uh, I mean, then you can do something else. There's you, the good thing about life is you can always like reset. You can always restart. In your own life. At what point did you feel you started believing that philosophy that you just shared? Was it always part of you? I think it was, and that, that basically had to do with the fact that I, I, I did so many unrelated random things in my life already. I actually, I, I, I every, like, ever, I mean, ever since I left college, like every two, three years, I started doing something totally different. 
So I, I've always been like, okay, I need to reinvent hmm. myself. Now I need to become a master in this. Oh, okay. Um, uh, now I need to become a master in this. And I mean, you know, it's it's kind of it's it's, it's kind of uh, part of who I am, but it's also kind of how I uh, how I how I live my life actually. Hmm. Okay. And the last question I have for you is, what's the best way for our viewers to get in touch with you or follow you along your journey? Ooh, uh, like just hit me up on LinkedIn. Like um, uh, I'm uh, very active on LinkedIn. It's uh, it's where I live uh, throughout the day, virtually. Um, so you can find me on LinkedIn, Ludwig uh, uh, Dumont. It's it's one one uh, one thing, and you can also follow me on Twitter. So I'm also on Twitter on Ludwig uh, Dumont. I think th those are like the two main places where you can find me. You can come to you can come come to Ghent too. It's where I live. But I mean, for for a lot of people, it's going to be a long flight. So. Sounds good. We'll, have, we'll make sure to have those links in the landing page. Uh, I've enjoyed your insights for this past hour. Thanks for your time, Ludwig. Ludwig, Ludwig Dumont. Thank you so much for having me. I, yeah, thanks for having me. I, I hope you can get something out of it.